Hey everyone! Today we are doing an episode of Transformation Time. This is a show where you get to hear about our guest speakers, talk about their personal development uh, journey, their mindset shifts that they've gone through to get to where they uh, are right now. And just even hearing about where they are right now, what their big, big goals are, and even what kind of changes they will be going through changing now to meet those big goals. So I find this really exciting uh, to listen to other people's journeys because you start realizing that we're not all different. We just really have to commit to our goals and try to complete them because if you're committed, you'll always achieve your goals. It's all about that. So let's see if we can get to me. I've accepted it, so hopefully it works this time. Although I feel like when it takes long like this, there's an issue. Actually, you know what I might do? Maybe if I accept it, I'm gonna cancel it, Dimitri. Oh, no, it's in. Okay, perfect. <laughs> we made it happen. How are you? Good, how about yourself? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So like I was saying, it's always awesome to hear people's journeys because like that we're all, everyone can do what we're doing and it's really just some of us, I think, focus on our better at, you know, getting, achieving our goals and others may just kind of give up thinking that there's nothing can be done. So let's just start with a little bit of letting people know where are you right now in your real estate journey and anything else that you'd like to share? Yeah, uh, so, so right now um, I'm currently a full-time uh, realtor and real estate investor. And um, so um, currently we're, we basically look for properties to uh, uh, buy and hold for long-term for cash flow. That's our, that's our main goal. Last year we found uh, some, that was a little difficult last year with rising prices and stuff, but we took advantage of flipping properties last year and now we're pivoting back to uh, the buy and hold and burst strategy. So that's kind of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very true. I think a lot of people are actually in that strategy to exactly what you're saying. Like last year, flips were amazing. <laughs> and this year, it's either, yeah, the small, small burrs. So the very, like, like a very small renovation and then renting it out or just buying something and just renting it out. So I completely agree with you. We are seeing a lot of that right now, too. Or I mean, I, should, I would say, I, I've been seeing a lot of that right now, too. So let's start from the very beginning. Uh, what exactly got you into real estate, into being a realtor? You know, what, what made you even start thinking about this? Well, it was um, after college in my early 20s. I, you know, it seems to be the story of everybody, but it's the truth. I read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, and it kind of just kind of changed my whole way of thinking a bit. Um, I did see uh, some people investing in student rentals and um, at the time going to college, I, I saw that and uh, I saw that there was an opportunity there. So um, yeah, that's kind of how I got started. Uh, my first acquisition was, was a student rental and kind of started from there. And uh, yeah, that's the beginnings. And um, one of the main reasons for investing in real estate, like, like many others, is to, to have that ability to have some financial freedom in the future. And that was kind of my goal and my fiance at the time, now my wife, uh, both of our goals. And um, yeah, so it, it, that was the beginnings. Awesome. And so, but out getting out of university, uh, you were working, you were doing something else, right? Um, yeah, I, originally I was, um, I took uh, electrical engineering. So I, I was working in um, automation and um uh, construction related work um, got my electrical license as well and decided to go into business for myself um, so I, I ran an HVAC company with a partner for about three years and then my wife and I opened up uh, electrical contracting business which we ran for um, over seven years um, so that was our introduction to you know um, active business and um, in parallel with that we were running our own real estate company um, mainly for managing our own uh, properties. So we learned a lot along the way about property management 
And uh, yeah, that's kind of um, where it started from that perspective. And, that's awesome. And so you actually were already an entrepreneur. And so what made you go then from your those types of businesses to getting more into the full time uh, being full time real estate investor? Um, I, I think what it was was um, I want to kind of keep my my mind all in, in one area. So, uh, you know, when you're doing contracting, and then you're doing investing or something else, you're kind of jumping around a lot. And um, I always think it's better to focus on something that you're good at and something you enjoy. It's not that I didn't enjoy the, the electrical field. I was involved with that for a very long time, but um, I think I want to scale down with having um, employees as well. And um, just, just, you know, just uh, as many employees, I guess, and kind of concentrate more on, um, you know, just, uh, just real estate. That's, That's awesome. And so, um, so, but during while you had your other businesses, you, you said you were already investing in other properties. And then, so I guess you had that kind of feeling of you had enough income to just go full time or, or how did the thought process go for making that transition? And was it a little bit scary for you to transition into that? Um, not really because, um, I guess it always is a little bit scary when, when you just, you know, you move from one thing to another, but we'd already kind of done the big plunge, I would say from working for somebody, um, full time, uh, you know, that nine to five job to moving, um, into business on my own, starting up an electrical contracting business from scratch. So I already kind of knew how it feels, uh, when your stomach kind of drops the first time, <laughs> but, <laughs> We, we were, you know, it, it, like anything you do, it's a risk, right, to, to do that. But, it, um, you know, we, we're quite happy that it worked out quite well. And we really enjoyed uh, doing it, worked with a lot of great people. Um, so moving, you know, from deciding to sell our, our, our electrical contracting company and just move full time into real estate and, and you know, getting my real, realtor license, it was an easy transition because I was already investing in real estate. And even in our electrical business, we work with a lot of um, investors. So, you know, adding meters on their homes to, you know, separately meter apartment units and knob and tube rewires, all these type of things too. So, um, yeah, so it was quite easy. And we were already, we already had our own properties. We, we were, well, you know, we would use our electrical con contracting company to do the rewiring on the properties, which was a bonus. Mm -hmm. um, but you're renovating uh, properties, um, you know, doing the burst strategy or flipping properties in parallel with the electrical company. So it was, um, to answer your question, uh, make a long story short, um, the, the second time was a lot easier than the first time uh, transition. Yeah, so tell us about your first time, because you're right, like that, like a lot of us are used to the job, right? The, it's talked about in high school, university, like it's talked about so much that I feel like it's an easy thing to get a job, but we don't talk it. They don't talk enough about starting your own business, being self-employed in this area. So it is true. How was, how was, how was, how was that transition? And even at, like that, even with your wife, like that, the whole thing probably must've been scary. <laughs> yeah, it certainly was um, in the beginning. I, I think he like, any advice I would say is like, well, what I learned is it's just, you know, you, you have to do your research and be prepared before you, you do that. Um, you can't be for everything. Like you're learning every day, running a business, but you, you have to be prepared at least a little bit financially, like just, you know, have a little bit of a, um, a slush fund, I would say, put, put aside for three or four months. Because in the beginning, like when I started that um, electrical contracting business, I, I didn't pay myself for four or five, months just to make sure that all the employees were getting paid and suppliers were being paid, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you just have to um, have a good plan in place, a good business plan, um, and really have to um, strategize on, on, on sales and business development because without that, you're, you know, you're not going to succeed at all. Um, so yes, it was scary. And, and I think it's very similar to somebody um, buying their first investment property, you know, it's that fear factor. You, you always have to get over, get over that hump. Once you do it and you get some systems in, in, in place and procedures and understand um, how to do it, then, you know, that it, it goes away. You know, it, the fear is always there a little bit, but it, it, it definitely dumbs down a lot. 
around. So um, hopefully that answers. Completely agree. Yeah, those systems in place definitely help too. I feel make you feel better also just because they're there because you need them because you already have enough business coming through that, you know, helps you out. So did you ever in any, in, I would say again, I'm going to probably talk about your first businesses because um, I mean, but you can also even in the real estate side, I'm just curious, did you ever feel like quitting and how did you get over those or did you get nervous like you said those five months like not paying yourself did did those kind of things make you nervous and and think like maybe I should get back into like getting a job or 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 how did you talk yourself out of it or make yourself feel better when those situations happened um yeah you know um you have to stay I, I feel like you have to stay optimistic and I I have a good, uh, good partner. My wife's very encouraging and um, very supportive. Um, in, in the beginning, she didn't quite uh, leave her job right away until things were a bit stable. And um, but you know, um, it, it's all about building good relationships and, and networking and all that. And I just just felt that okay, um, I just want to make sure that uh, people that are working for me are. Um, happy first my customers are happy and everything like that before i started paying myself um having um you know a, a bit of a plan in place for example like we did have some properties with some cash flow so that helps a little bit um there wasn't a substantial amount at that time but um you know that's kind of what kept me going and i um every day i, I just got more motivated you know as, as you acquire another uh customer they're happy they tell somebody else it doesn't matter what business uh, you're running. As long as you treat people well, they're going to see that in you. And um, that's going to help you be uh, successful. You know, being honest, being trustworthy. Um, you know, um, people can see see through you if you aren't, right? And uh, that's who people want to work with. And especially in the uh, trade business, contracting, um, engineering, any, anything like that you know, being reliable is, is very important, right? So when people see that you're reliable, you show up, uh, you do what you say you're going to do and get the job done, um, that right away that, that just gives you a 10 out of 10 in a lot of people's heads. So uh, by kind of maintaining that, that's what made us successful. Um, when someone called me, you, I, I answered the phone or called them back very quickly. I still do this, in, you know, as a realtor, I Prompt service is very important, and um, that's what people want to see is reliability, and um, that's mm -hmm. I felt felt was the key. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Yeah, all great points. It is true. Um, reliability is very important, especially if you're running a business, because uh, exactly you said, right? If they can't rely on you, <laughs> they're going to be looking for someone else. Because uh, that happens a lot, especially if you're like just because my husband's in renovations, you know, he hears so many horror stories of people just disappearing or who knows. And it's just, uh, it's just crazy to hear. And these kind of things are so important to help building the network, like you said, and having people call you back because you are actually good at what you do. And like that, like reliable, like you're saying. So what in this process of, of, the different phases you went through, what kind of changes did you have to do in yourself to uh, to keep on moving forward? Yeah, I, I think sometimes when someone um, starts any type of business too, you try and wear all the hats. Um, you have to in the beginning just to get rolling, but there's a point where, you know, it's really hard to do, but you have to, um, you know, start delegating tasks it's very important um, in order to scale or grow any business. You, you, you have to know when it's the right time to hire um, someone to help you with, you know, administration work or an assistant to something or a project manager. Um, you know, so I, I found that, you know, it, it's hard. It was hard for me sometimes in the beginning to, you know, give the reins to somebody else because you, you always feel that no one's going to do as good of a job as you, but you, you have to, you know, trust the trust people build good relationships and and we did we had some great people um that helped us along the way and do today and um yeah that's uh i would say the the biggest part of my development was delegating and um you know really building good relationships with people and uh yeah 
I completely agree. Yeah, I feel like for a lot of people, I think that's what stops people from becoming, you know, self-employed to having employees is that struggle to allow other people to do the work and accepting that everyone works differently. <laughs> And really, like you said, what matters is the relationship, you know, are they able, like, do you connect well together? Are they actually providing value, even though it may be in a different way than, you know, than let's say you or I would do things. But as long as those things are met, I do notice a lot of people in, in the real estate community really struggle with, with that, just bringing on someone and then, and then they just kind of get frustrated very quickly, you know, oh, they're not doing things this way. And, and then they kind of give up on them. Also, I, in that sense, saying like giving them enough time to learn what it is that needs to be done. Um, because I like that, like I've noticed in the real estate community that a lot of people I don't think give, especially I would say with VAs a lot more. Because I feel like when you're hiring teams, like it's a little bit different. Like you're hiring a contractor. I mean, they should know what to do, but even the communication is sometimes an issue, but it's a little bit different. And I noticed with the VAs, they're like, oh my God, they're not doing the tasks like I say, or they're not doing this way and that way. And and I'm like, you guys are like having to learn how to communicate with each other. You know, there's so many different things involved, understanding what it is the way you want it to be done. You know, and usually it's the person not providing enough information for the VAs or like the contractors for them to do the job the way you expect it to be done. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever notice that specifically on the communication side, like having to even develop your commu communication skills more to be able to get what you needed done? Um, it, yes. It, well, yeah. Communication skills are really important for sure. Um, but is that something you already had developed or did you feel like as you were going through phases that you had to improve on them? Um, I think there's always room for improvement. I think where I had a little bit of an advantage as a contractor is, you know, working, um, you know, before I went into business, I wanted to learn as much as I could working for others and always did a good job doing that. Always uh, did my best 110% for employers, but um, working with, um, you know, working in the engineering world and, and corporate world, you, you know, working with, with people that are um, more educated sometimes than you or more experienced than you, you kind of develop those skills. So I think I, 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 I had a good start on that, um, writing estimates, um, writing them very well um, so that people understood them. And that was one thing that helped very well was having a really good estimate. Um, so I think my communication skills were, were fairly good. But I definitely improved on that over the years, you know, um, for sure. And, um, yeah. So that's great because actually that leads into my next question, which so, so from going from the corporate world or even university, there's, you, there's some skills that are, we always come and we use. So like you're saying, in the corporate world, the estimations was something that really helped you to improve your first business. Any other skills that you would like to say that you had as young, you know, as a kid or in university or through your corporate world that helped you get your businesses up and running, get into real estate investing? Um, yeah, d definitely. Um, I, I think something I had to develop over time, like a, a skill that I had a weakness in was uh, maybe, you know, um, I, I thought I wasn't much of a social person, but I actually was <laughs> realizing I go into business. Like I really enjoyed the part I enjoyed the most was the sales and business development and, and just meeting others and helping others. Um, but, uh, you know, develop those skills. I think a lot with the project management side, um, and didn't even kind of realize that, um, that the skill was there. So like, um, I did a lot of industrial automation work, um, you know, robotics and automation um, and manufacturing plants, steel plants, stuff like that. And uh, you don't realize sometimes the skill set that you have in order to execute the project from start to finish. And you're dealing with the engineer, the plant manager, you know, a lot of different people in, in the plant. And, and um, yeah, so that's, um, you know, that was a skill I, I guess I, I didn't think that I had very well, but 
after going into business, I, I realized it was there from a lot of the project management. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. And it is that, like a lot of people. And the reason why I like to emphasize this is because a lot of people, for example, will get into real estate or want to get into real estate, but they're like, oh, I don't have any skills for it. And understanding that what you've done in the past can be transferred over. And yes, there's always going to be learning in anything you do. But there are also skills from the past that you can bring over that help you, you know, have that edge up to not be starting from zero. And you, we always have at least something to help us move forward. I agree. So what about, for example, sacrifices? What kind of sacrifices did you feel like you had to do either consciously when you started or unconsciously and noticed afterwards that, wow, I had to sacrifice this to, you know, get to where you are now? I, I think the biggest sacrifice I think all, all of us make, I, I definitely made was, was time, right? Like, um, to get a business going, you, um, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you're, you're definitely committing a lot of time. So a lot of weekends, evenings, uh, definitely was a huge sacrifice in the business to get it going. Um, you, you know, and, and, and when I kind of realized that, you know, I, I have to start hiring people to help so I can get my life back a bit. Um, that's when, you know, you start hiring people. I started hiring people because, like in, in my case, I have children. So once we started having our, our girls, you know, I, I definitely didn't want to be working that many hours. So um, yeah, th that definitely was a huge sacrifice was time for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's a lot. Uh, also for a lot of people, they don't realize like how much time too. sometimes. Like you think like, oh, I can make it work with a like a nine to five or certain set hours. But when it's your own business, I, I don't think, that especially at the very beginning i don't think that's possible because you to just get it started is a lot of energy to just make sure it's you know up and running but once it's stable then i feel like you like you said you put things in place either hire people to help you out to minimize or it just stables out a bit and and you're not doing as much work as as you did let's say in the beginning yes yeah for sure yeah, that you definitely have to you need help. You have to surround yourself with people that can help you, whether you're hiring them or, or um, outsourcing that. Um, definitely, because you'll get burnt out. Like, it, it's going to happen eventually. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that's also, I feel like burnout is inevitable, isn't it, when you're starting any business? Because you put, like, your full-on energy into it. And I think you get so focused because your mind is like, I need to make this work. It becomes almost like a non-negotiable, right? And then, and then you go through phases of burnout. Did, did that happen to you? Yes, it definitely did. That, that's for sure. It definitely went through the phases, and and you know, and sometimes you just you have to figure out what well, you know. How, how am I going to fix this problem, and or or who do I need to um, you know help or or hide you know in order to get over that and uh yeah definitely uh hit those walls a few times <laughs> yeah sure. yeah i hear you i've also gone through a couple of burnouts <laughs> pretty bad ones and you're just like keeled over i need to like take some time off <laughs> i don't know if you were able to take time off but i was able to get a couple like some time off because i was just like zero <laughs> did you so when you went through the these burnouts what kind of um like changes happened afterwards. Um, yeah, the changes was coming up with with better systems, right? Um, like, like like coming up with um, like like if you're doing a particular type of job, say like we'll take contracting, um, like I don't know, maybe you're installing, a, keep it very simple, a certain type of light uh, light fixture, then you almost want to come up with a good procedure so that. Um, you can hand that job off to someone pretty easy, right? So then you can have any like, in, in my case, right? Um, or if you're a plumber, you know, like um, just kind of systemize that job and, and make it like a production line. So we kind of started doing that with some projects when we we're doing like duplex conversions for, for clients, right? Uh, we had a system in place on, on how these things were going to be wired, how we would rough it in, um, you know, what devices, right down to the devices we would use on finishing. So everything's consistent 
and um, it just it just works. You know, we pass inspection every time. So that's kind of what what we use for for that is, is those type of procedures and systems. Yeah, and that's a great point, which I want to reiterate again because actually, and I don't know if it's an engineering thing because I do the same. <laughs> But it's the same. I love creating systems. And it, like you said, it kind of helps the transition to giving it to other people a lot smoother. I feel like, I mean, the process may not always be the best for that other person, but at least it's enough for them to get what they need to get done. Because I've noticed the same thing. Like you put the systems in place and it, and it helps you or the processes. You create the process of how to do things. You give it to them. They probably have to tweak it and do make it work for them. But at least it gives that one um, level of help. Because I noticed that at the beginning, if you just tell them this is how it, you know this is what I want done, usually you don't. It's not enough information to get the work done. Whereas like if you do it yourself, you write the processes out or the steps that everything's involved. When you actually kind of put some thought into it, you realized how much is inside your head compared to what you actually tell people. <laughs> and uh, what, what about you? Did that happen? Was, is that like that with you? Um, yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And um, like I, I find like, even from a real estate perspective, it's like, you know, there's a system for everything. And it might even start with like your realtor. This is exactly what I'm looking for. If it doesn't meet this criteria, don't bother even showing me the properties. Yeah. Okay. You're probably still going to send your, you know the search and you'll see different things but um yeah so it comes down to that and then when the property you know i'm just giving an example the property kind of yeah fits in that criteria i'm looking for a fourplex or a fiveplex or whatever it is now it goes on my spreadsheet do the numbers work uh no they don't work the way I, I want my business to run and um you know i'm not going to tweak the numbers to try and make it work either just because that property seems attractive so that's kind of where I start and then you know the next step and the next step so I believe like yeah it's very important uh like it, it helps me sleep at night <laughs> <laughs> I agree I agree now let's talk about some of the projects you've worked on so it's uh your real estate projects that you've worked on what is the biggest learning experience you've gotten from one or many of your projects? Um, yeah, I, I'm going to say one of the uh, most important things I've learned is hiring the right contractor or sub trades, however you're going to manage your job. Like if you don't have the experience to manage um, a bunch of sub trades, don't try and hire your own plumber, electrician and all that and try and manage them on your own because you'll really get taken advantage of. Um, it, and, and mainly it's a schedule, you know, like, um, but hiring, um, the right trades, the right contractors is very important. And a lot of people would say, well, why it's, it's because it keeps, it, they can make or make you, make you or break you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and if you want to keep on, on schedule, right? Like, um, you want to get that job done. Maybe you're doing a duplex conversion. You want it done in four months. Um, you know, obviously things were a little bit different with COVID, but, you know, in an ideal world without COVID, um, if you want that project done in four months, then you need to have a reliable contractor. And in a lot of cases, like um, we're purchasing properties that, you know, an aid lender won't give you money, won't lend on. So we may have to take private funds. And when you're borrowing private money, you can't afford for that project to be eight or nine months. You know, you need that to be done quickly. So that's the biggest lesson I've learned is uh, hiring, hiring the right uh, contractors. And again, going back to what I said before, reliable contractors that, you know, make the commitment to get it done on time and we'll, we'll get it done on time. And then those are the contractors you need to work with. hundred um, percent. It is very true. And I feel like even though we're saying it, I feel like people will still do it because that's something I've also said too, is always, especially with new investors, they're always about cheap, 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 cheap. But then understanding if you go cheap, 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 that means you have to have like your eyes on them 24 <laughs> seven. Because usually cheap, 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 cheap means no ex, they're not an expert at what they're doing, meaning that you really know, need to know what you're doing. That being said, 
never also does it this doesn't also mean you have to go with super expensive it just means that you need to make sure like you said right you're finding the right type of people for the job that will get the job done right because i see this happening so much and i say like you tell them and tell them and <laughs> tell you guys again don't do it <laughs> um, yeah i definitely agree that so that that's one of them and i'd probably say my the second lesson i've learned is is working with the other professionals on your team, whether um, you know, I'm going to say, especially a mortgage agent and a realtor is very important, and um, you know, other professionals like that, accounts. If you can work with people like, especially a realtor, like you want to work with someone, I believe that is a real estate investor. And I remember the book, um, you know, I, Don Campbell's book, The Acre Book. A lot of people have probably read it. He always says, "Don't work with someone unless they've owned at least five properties." because they're not going to be able to give you the proper advice. And, you know, until I owned five properties, um, you know, I, I, I said to myself, well, that can't be true. I can just get any realtor right in the beginning. Right. But I actually realized that that's actually true because you have to go through the ups and downs, make the mistakes and, and refine your processes. And I find by the time you have, you've either bought and you're buying and holding five properties or flipped or whatever your strategy is, you know, um, yeah, that, that advice definitely is true. Like, you know, someone that has the same mindset um, and um, has been through the ups and downs so they can give you the proper advice. 100% I agree. And just the way they look at properties are completely different because a realtor that talks to uh, just regular homeowners and how, you know, they do things, like it's like, to running a business in real estate is two different things. So it's very true what you say in, in all aspects of the different types of professionals you need on the team because it's just very different eyes that see and they don't take into consideration things that, you know, real estate investor type professionals would because they know of the different things that come into play that you wouldn't see on the homeowner's side when they're buying houses. So completely agree with you on that. Any other types of, oh, actually, sorry, I wanted to also reiterate something that you were saying that it's kind of indirectly you were saying, and I wanted to uh, reiterate was that basically you're also talking about like the importance of networking um, and just getting to know people to find those people to find the right teams. Uh, because it, I feel like it takes time to also define that core team, those people that you trust. Is that, did you feel the same way for you? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. You know, it's um, investing in real estate, like it, it, even though there, there's a lot of people when you're in a community that invest in, you go, wow, there's lots of real uh, real estate investors out there. In, in reality, it's actually a really small amount of people that invest in real estate and, you know, general public, right? And um, it, within that small group you know you, you want to find some of that you can work with well and and like you said has the same same mindset so yeah that's um or core values i would say that was my biggest learning experience is that all different investors have different values and they look at things differently and even those kind of things can clash yeah they can and and uh yeah it's, it's really important you, you, you want to and and some some people that you network with too, you, you want to see like how busy are they? Do they have too many clients and I'm not going to get the service that I want. So that's another thing that I've learned along the way. Some mortgage brokers, like they're just way too busy. Right. And, um, you know, you found a property or you're, you're trying to close on it and, you know, you're just not getting the service that you need. So yeah, definitely by networking with others, if um, even though you may really like that mortgage broker, for example, it's good to have a backup uh, mortgage broker or a third one that you can work with. So you can always get your deal done. So yeah, by networking, you definitely can meet more like-minded people and um, build a good power team. And your power team doesn't just have to be one of each, um, you know, definitely. Yeah, completely agree. It's very, very true. Actually, I remember one person because I have like my main lawyer and then I have, like you said, I have my backups. And um, I found it really funny because, you know, talking to other investors and they were in shock that this lawyer said no to me for one of the deals that I had to get done. And they're like, 
but you give him so much business and this and this and that. And, and I was just kind of like, I actually appreciate that he told me he's too busy. Because like you were saying, I was just like, if he doesn't have the time to do my project, I don't want him to try to do mine and not be able to get it done successfully or miss dates or whatever, because his mind is on on other pro on other deals that he has to get done. So I completely agree with you because it's like, we don't want to also be in a point where like our, our things are getting neglected just because we want to use that specific person to take care of things. So hundred percent agree. Backups are definitely also important and being accepting of that and not like that, not being upset if they can't do it. It's, you know, it's <laughs> that's yeah. a good thing. I feel like it's good if they tell you they can't do it because they showing that they value their customers and making sure that they're going to get the right quality of work done that, that they would want you to get. Yes, I, I agree for sure. And so what about any, so what are your, um, you know, five, 10 year goals? Like what's your, what are your big, big goals that you're trying to achieve right now? Um, well, I think, um, I, I, I'm kind of moving towards a, a larger multifamily. So that's kind of my, uh, my goals in, in, in the, uh, you know, next few years. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm kind of moving towards. Um, also like from a realtor's perspective too, um, you know, I'm, uh, I enjoy helping others kind of, um, you know, build a good portfolio. So, um, I've been, I'm, I'm a realtor in my, um, uh, year two and, um, you know, I really enjoy doing it and, um, I find that I could share my, my knowledge with, with others that want to grow a portfolio. I can analyze properties and all do that. So my, my goal is the long term is to help others build portfolios, uh, build my portfolio and, um, yeah, that's uh, my, my goals. and um, That's awesome. And so what kind of changes are you starting to then have to do now? Like, what do you have in your mind of changes you have to do now to be able to achieve those goals? Yeah, so um, one thing that we're, we're, we've we been starting to do in uh, the last couple of years is joint ventures. So um, as everybody knows, property values have gone up a lot, especially during COVID. So we're realizing that, you know, you, you, it, it's a little difficult to uh, fund projects all by yourself. And I'm sure a lot of people are in the same position. So, you know, we're using um, other people's money or, or partnering with others now. And we're finding that, that that's going quite well. And, um, you know, two heads are sometimes better than one, whether, um, you know, it depends on who you partner with and what they're bringing to the table. But um yeah, that's kind of what we're doing. And um, yeah, and sometimes someone is starting out in real estate, and they don't really know what to do, um, you know, by partnering with what with, with, uh, have the experience doing these things, at least they can learn along the way. And maybe they do the second one on their own. Um, maybe they have the funds to do it, but just not, you know, the active portion of it. So that's kind of or even I'm the doing. interest Some people just don't want to do it and be like, take my money, just make me money. <laughs> You're absolutely right that we have a, a one partner that we uh, bought a property with. Um, it was a fiveplex. They showed up in the beginning when it was just like a wreck and showed up when it was done. And I don't think they've been there in four years, <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, you're absolutely right. Sometimes they don't have an interest on, on, on you know, being involved in any way. They, you know, just want to collect the cash flow checks and kind of be updated with financials and how the property is running. So I totally agree with you. <laughs> and, um, yes. and and that's kind of like, you know, working with others, I think, gets you to uh, larger goals. Um, and, um, you know, acquiring multifamily takes a lot more capital. So in order for us to achieve um, that, that's where, where we're um, partnering. So mm -hmm. that's your question. Yeah, I completely agree. And what about um, with your so uh oh my god i just blanked out <laughs> with uh with jv's that's what i wanted to talk about so any experiences that you like to share about you know partnering up because even doing jv's is a very tough thing to do there's always lots of learning experiences from it would you like to share some of those yeah i, I think it's just you know you have to get 
everyone's expectations on the table from the get go, right? And, and everyone just has to understand what they're they're putting into the deal and what everybody's going to do. I think that's the most important part. And I, I don't think it's always a good idea to partner with someone just because maybe they have money or they, you know, maybe they, they have another skill set that you kind of want. Like if you're not going to be able to work together, it's like a marriage, right? I, I look at it when I, when I work with somebody generally, especially if it's like going to be a buy and hold or a bird project, like I want to be in it five years, you know, minimum, like it, it's towards helping my partner and, and, um, and, and, myself and my family and their family to, um, you know, uh, my goal was cash flow and, you know, build a portfolio for retirement for both me and my partner. So yeah, you definitely want to make sure that they're in for, you know, the long haul. And um, to me, real estate investing is not a get rich thing tomorrow. So you have to be committed and uh, understand what everybody wants to, uh, what everybody wants out of it at the end of the day, what's their goals, what's your goals. I think that's the most important thing off um, like from the beginning. And then from that point, you definitely want to make sure it's on paper. So um, mm -hmm. next thing is make sure you have a good joint venture agreement um, and get your own lawyer and um, definitely um, advise your partner to have their own lawyer review that document as well. You definitely don't want to have one lawyer, lawyer do both, both sides. 100% agree. Any other any other kind of changes or mindset shifts that you would like to talk about? Um, yeah, uh, I guess like the only thing I can, the advice I can kind of give anybody is that uh, like, especially if you're starting out that that fear factor is always the tough part. But, um, you know, um, if you want to invest in real estate, it's, it's, it is one of the best things to invest in, in my opinion. Um, partner with someone maybe that has done it. That's uh, if you're afraid to do it on your own, um, that's a great way to start or, or maybe get a coach or a mentor if you want to do it by yourself. But um, yeah, don't be afraid to do it. It's um, it provide your family with a great future. So um, that's, I guess, the main advice I can give. <laughs> So. completely agree yeah it's always if you want to get into it definitely because i can tell you and i'm sure you've probably experienced the same is that when you're doing it and your fears are very strong if you're not able to motivate yourself to do it at least if you're partnered up with other people they will keep you motivated or if you have coaches and stuff they'll kind of rationalize the irrational fears that you start getting from when you go through your phases in real estate. <laughs> it, it, exactly. And um, yeah, it's a team with the right people and um, to get over that, that's for sure. And people that are optimistic and want to help you and, um, you know, in order to even buy real estate, you need to have a good team, um, good mortgage broker, good realtor, good contractor. So partner up with people that are optimistic that want to help you and, um, you know, that they want to grow with you together. So, mm -hmm. and I would also say, don't give up too. You know, if you do find like it, it doesn't work with someone or, or just things go badly, always take that as, you know, what didn't you like from there and what don't you want to happen again? Understanding what it is that that shouldn't happen again and moving forward because i feel like all also the saddest part is when you hear people say that for example oh i have the worst tenant in the world i'm i'm gonna sell my property and never never do this again and those kind of things just like sadden me because it's just like wow you went through this traumatizing phase and you didn't actually learn from it and improve on it and realize what your mistakes were because i feel like especially when those types of situations happen when you're so like traumatized from it i feel like you learn the most from it and you'll be like that's never happening again to me but in the sense but you still keep on going forward like never happening like there's people that will be like that's never happening again and then they sell off their house but it should be like that's never happening again and creating new processes to make sure that it won't happen again. Cause I feel like you will never make that happen again. Cause it is so traumatizing. <laughs> oh, I certainly agree. And I have a good story about that too. So uh, the first investment property, as I mentioned, was a student rental. 
Um, this is in, in, in Hamilton. That's, that's where I'm from. So we had one near uh, the college and um, it went well in the beginning, first three years, you know, but once the college built their own residences, there, all like all the good students want to go to the residence. So, you know, it, it was a little tougher finding uh, great students, uh, you know, to, to rent yours, you know, to stay in their rooms in the student rental. Well, um, yeah, so that year we, um, we had some students that weren't too great. And I think the mistake we made was trying to fill those vacancies quickly, which we should have waited a little longer. Well, they ended up, you know, not totally destroying the place, but they played golf in the property and everything like that. <laughs> um, so at the end of the day, like, you know, a little bit of money to repair things. But um, so what we did differently is we, we decided that, you know, student renting was, was not for us. And we um, decided that we're going to just rent an apartment. So we converted it into a duplex, rented the families. And from there, um, we never made that mistake again and, and really um, refined our processes for, uh, project manage, uh, uh, property management, selecting tenants and how we're going to manage properties. And that was our lesson learned, but we didn't give up. We um, converted that to a duplex and then uh, started buying more properties. So um, yeah, that's a, a story to your point there is don't give up, yeah. just figure out how to make it work for yourself. And, you know, maybe it may not, uh, you know, renting the students may not be for you. Renting the families may not be for you. Maybe flipping's not for you. Find what's for you, what works, what's going to make you money and um, what's going to make you happy, right? And uh, I move forward with that. 100%. I love the story because it's also that the, like that sometimes it is about, you know, just tweaking the processes, but other times like yours, pivoting and changing to a different strategy. You know, so, and even just realizing that that's available, because I think lots of people like that, like, just quit and give up. And it's like, let's get rid of it. And it's like, no, no, you know, like that in your case, didn't even want to deal with student rentals. Let's get into it. Let's make it a duplex and, and make it work that way. So I think that's an awesome story. That's really great because it showed even like, in your case, it was just like, let's pivot, let's change, because it's just not fun dealing with students. Let's Let's do something else, deal with families. <laughs> and I hear you. I've never had student rentals, but it seems like a lot of work and I just never had interest in it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on. Loved hearing your stories. It was really great to hear what you had to say. You shared a lot of valuable information. So if anyone wants to follow Dimitri, he's going to be shared on this uh, in the description. And um, any final words that you'd like to tell the audience? Um, not, not really. I'm just going to say, like, just uh, like I would say about the fear thing, just don't, uh, if you're, you're on this, if you're listening right now and you, you have been invested, don't, don't be afraid. Just, just jump in with two feet and do it. Um, or reach out if you, if you need some help. I'm happy to, you're to give any advice to anybody that, that um, wants to get started. And uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much my, my Awesome. Advice. Thanks so much for coming on. Loved hearing your stories. And we'll see everyone in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye, Dimitri. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Cheers.